Welcome to week three, episode three of our series, Defiant Joy. Yeah, that's right. During this global pandemic, during COVID-19, we are talking about and doing a deep dive into this powerful thing called joy. We actually think there's no better thing to talk about during a season of anxiety and fear than joy. Because what our world needs right now is joy. I mean, there's a lot of calls for just blind optimism. There's a lot of trite cliches going around. But we believe that God invites us to a life of joy. He invites us to a life of something that's deeper and bigger and stronger and more beautiful than just optimism for optimism's sake. And that is joy. Here's the definition that we've been using throughout this series for joy. Joy is this. Joy is a God-produced good feeling in the soul that enables us to respond to all of life's experiences with eternal perspective. Joy is something that God produces, and it's a, a good feeling. It's a good feeling, a good emotion that actually is not on the surface like a smile or a laugh, but it's deep down in our souls, and it enables us. It empowers us to see whatever life throws at us, the good, the bad, the ugly, with an eternal perspective. And we can feel good about it all. Doesn't that sound incredible during this time? But we've discussed throughout this series that a lot of times people get tripped up thinking that joy is actually happiness. And this this idea of seeking and running after things that just make us happy, I mean, it's actually ingrained deeply into the American psyche from the very beginning. I think we find it in the opening of the Declaration of Independence. So class, if I can take you back to like uh, U.S. Civ or history class, this is what the beginning of the Declaration of Independence says. It says that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and what? And the pursuit of happiness. And my friends, is that not something we're incredible at in our country, in our society today, is pursuing happiness. Isn't that amazing? And we pursue happiness in lots of different ways. Uh, We pursue happiness through possessions, I was doing some research during this quarantine. Some, what are the things that Americans are buying? And we seek after happiness through what we buy all the time, whether that be a new backsplash and doing some house renovations, whether that be a new lawnmower because it's time to start mowing our yards, uh, whether that be a new video game system. And there are people that haven't played video games in years, but they're buying new systems because they think if I just get this one thing, I'll be happy and I'll get through this tough time. We seek after happiness through our possessions. A lot of times we seek after happiness, we pursue happiness through people and through relationships, thinking that, oh, if I just find that right somebody, then I'm going to ultimately be happy. And so we go on websites like christianmingle.com, match.com, farmers only, or uh, anything like that, that we feel like if we just meet Mr. Right, if we just meet Mrs. Right, then we're finally going to be happy. And we just don't mention the idea that, hey, whatever relationship we enter into, we bring our baggage into as well. We're not going to do that. That's a talk for a whole other time. But we pursue happiness through people. We pursue happiness through places, I mean, I can be honest with you guys. So many times over the last couple of weeks, I have looked on Expedia.com or Travelocity to see how cheaply I can get to the Caribbean because I'm just thinking I just need to get a change of place, a change of perspective, and that will make me happy. And hey, I'm looking at you right now. Don't get on your browser. Don't look how cheap it is to get to the Caribbean right now because you will not be in Indiana next week. But we think that there are places that we can go to that will make us happy. Also, um, we pursue happiness through processes, through uh, systems that are going to lead us to a better us. Uh, This is the industry of self-help. Did you guys know that in 2019 alone, there was a this self-help industry was a 11 billion dollar industry in America alone. There were 18.6 million self-help books that were sold last year in 2019. I mean, that is a huge industry, and there's lots of promises about um, how we can pursue happiness, how we can become a better you if we just follow these three steps or these five steps. I mean, there's so many different incredible self-help books, but my absolute favorite was the 1988 bestseller, and you guys can look this up. This was a real self-help book. Anybody can be cool, but awesome takes practice. That guy who wrote that book is who I do not aspire to be when I grow up, right? But there's this incredible industry where people are seeking and pursuing after happiness. We look for it all over the place. The problem with pursuing happiness is that it's a moving target. 
that all these things like people and processes and places and possessions, they can all be taken away from us. They can all move. They can all change. It doesn't actually satisfy us on a soul level. But joy is deeper. It's more beautiful. It's more powerful than what pursuing happiness gives us. Karl Barth was a 19th century Bible scholar and theologian, and this is how he defined joy. I love this. He said this, that joy is a defiant nevertheless. Don't you love that? Joy is a defiant nevertheless. Nevertheless, if life throws the worst things at me, the worst curveballs, if I lose everything, joy is still going to be there because it is defiant, it is steadfast, and it is steady. And that is what God invites us into in this life of joy. So what I want to do this morning is I want to zoom in. I want to zero in on one weapon that we can put in our spiritual arsenal so that we can experience a life of defiant joy. And I don't think it's one that gets talked about a lot in context of joy. And I don't think that you'll see it coming or expect it when we're talking about defiant joy. But here is what we're going to talk about this morning. Humility. Living a life of humility. Now, this is how we're going to define humility as we move forward. I got this from John Dixon, who did a huge deep dive study into what humility was and the impact of humility on our world. He said this, that humility is the noble choice to forego your status and use your influence for the good of others. It's this noble choice to forego, forego your status and use your influence, your power to empower or bring good to others. It's so beautiful. And I'm going to argue, I'm going to try to convince you today that true joy is found when we live a life that is marked by that kind of humility. And to do so, we're going to spend some time today in Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, or what we have in our New Testaments, the book of Philippians. Now, I'll give you a little bit of background about Paul. Paul, at one point, was trying to stop the Jesus movement altogether. But Jesus actually met him and the resurrected Jesus turned his life upside down. He came face to face with the resurrected Jesus. And instead of trying to stop the Jesus movement, he became the biggest proponent of the Jesus movement in the first century. And he went everywhere in the known world telling people about Jesus, starting churches. But he actually got in a lot of trouble for this. The Roman Empire did not want somebody going around saying that Jesus was Lord because they believed that Caesar was Lord. And so Paul was thrown into prison multiple times. He had lots of trials and tribulations and challenges in his life because he wouldn't stop telling people that Jesus rose from the dead and that Jesus was Lord. And where we find Paul in the writing of this letter that's in our New Testament called Philippians is he's in prison. He's in prison for telling people about Jesus. But what's fascinating about this letter that he writes this church is that it's considered the letter of joy. <laughs> I mean, from a prison cell, this is the letter of joy. It's only four chapters long, but 14 times Paul uses the word joy or asks people to rejoice with him. It's a letter of joy. And, and just bare bones, why Paul is in such a good mood when he's writing this is because these Philippians actually supported Paul and they sent him food and supplies. And he's just overjoyed with what's happened in this relationship with his church in Philippi. And so he is talking about joy. He's thinking about joy. And he's in a dark situation in his life, but he has that defiant, nevertheless attitude. And so in chapter two of this letter that he wrote to this church and that we're listening in on today that we think is written for us today. This is what he does. He starts talking and teaching and challenging these people to live with this kind of humility uh, that leads us to joy. And so we're going to pick up here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. This is what Paul says. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility... Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. He says, I'm going to challenge you guys to live with humility. I love what Eugene Peterson, who is a Greek scholar and a pastor who wrote the paraphrased version of the Bible called The Message. This is how he paraphrased and translated that same passage in The Message. This is what he says. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. What a beautiful challenge that Peterson picks up from Paul's letter. I love this so much. He says, don't sweet talk your way to the top. 
Have you guys ever met somebody who they're, they're talking to you, they're being kind to you, and you find pretty quickly that there's ulterior motive? They want something from you. <laughs> Paul says, this is not the way I want you to live. This is not the following Jesus way of doing life. Be humble. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Don't be so concerned with how you're going to rise. He goes on. I love that he says, don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Don't be obsessed with carving out your margins. Don't be obsessed with finding your market. I mean, have you ever met somebody or maybe you struggle with this? People that live with this scarcity mindset that says, well, hey, if over there, if, they, if something good is happening to them, that means that there's less good that could possibly happen to me. And that's like this obsessing over what other people are doing and the good that's happening in other people's life and feeling jealous. And, and Paul is saying here, don't be obsessed with finding your advantage. <laughs> don't be obsessed with that. Think about somebody else. <laughs> Lend them a hand. Don't put all the attention on yourself. You see here, so often we think that Humility is about us humiliating ourselves or humiliating somebody else or thinking badly about ourselves, looking down on ourselves and not considering our talents or our abilities. But that's not what humility is about at all. I love C.S. Lewis, the great 20th century writer and theologian. He said this about humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less often. <laughs> Don't dog yourself or look down on yourself, but just be self-forgetful and find freedom in being self-forgetful so that you can think about other people. This is what Paul is challenging us to do to live a life of humility. And he turns the corner here and he starts giving us a picture of ultimate humility. And he looks at his savior, the leader of his life, Jesus of Nazareth. He says this in verse five of chapter two. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, what I want you guys to do, Paul is saying, is I want you to look at the mindset of Jesus and I want you to imitate that. Now, this word for mindset and attitude is actually the Greek word phreneo. And phreneo is a powerful word. It means so much more than just having a specific attitude or a mindset. It's kind of like a life's guiding principle. In other words, it'd be like the operating system that your computer runs off of. Everything is filtered through it, and the whole command center is found in this phreneo, in this attitude. Not only that, I think of it this way. Um, remember in Lion King, Hakuna Matata, you know, Timon and Pumbaa said this is their guiding principle through life. Have no worries for the rest of your days, right? This was uh, the, the Hakuna Matata of Jesus, if you guys will. This was his guiding principle throughout his life. And the guiding principle, the, the mindset of his life was humility, to not think of himself as the biggest deal, but to put others first. This was his phreneo, his attitude, his mindset. And for Paul to explain this phreneo of Jesus, this attitude and guiding principle and mindset of Jesus, he actually breaks into song in the next couple of verses. And a lot of Bible scholars believe this was the first Christian hymn, the first Christian song that was written in the first century that early Jesus followers would sing at their gatherings. And this is what he says here, starting in verse six. This is the song that he explains Jesus' humility in. He says, you know, I want you to have that same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross." And that's so beautiful. And I don't know what kind of song it was because it doesn't rhyme in English, but it's so beautiful and so powerful. Paul explains that the mindset of Jesus, he made himself nothing. And he took the form of a servant or a slave. And he took it all the way to giving up his own life at the cross. Now, this idea of he made himself nothing, theologians and Bible scholars have argued and and written about this for centuries now. And it comes down to this theological idea of kenosis. And kenosis in the Greek was the idea of emptying yourself or setting aside the privilege that you have for somebody else. And this is exactly what Jesus did. Jesus didn't stop becoming God, but he set aside his divine privilege, sort of put it over to the right 
put it over to the left and said, I don't need this right now. I'm going to set it aside so that I can take the form of a slave, of a servant for the people that I love. And he took this all the way to being found not as the exalted God that he was, but found in the appearance of a man and then in the appearance of a slave or a humble servant. And he took this all the way to death on a cross. <laughs> he took humility all the way to saying, I'm going to my demise for people. And, and this is where it might get a little confusing for you because you think that doesn't sound real good. That sounds like it's not going to lead me to joy. It sounds like it's going to lead me to pain and death. But uh, one of the writers in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews, uh, we don't know exactly who he was or who she was, but uh, she said this in Hebrews 12, verse two, we looked at this last week, says this, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. In other words, when Jesus ultimately humbled himself in the form of a servant and went to the cross, it brought him joy. And you know what that joy was that was set before him? It was you. It was me. It was billions of people that would be brought back into relationship with him through his sacrifice and for his uh, taking down hell and sin and death through his act of love at the cross. It brought Jesus ultimate joy to be ultimately humble and become a servant at the cross. Isn't that so incredible? In, in some ways, Jesus is saying here and with his life and Paul is saying here in this letter that ultimate joy is found in ultimate humility, ultimate surrender and servanthood. Paul continues with what I think is one of the most radically and explosively written sentences in all of human literature. He says this in verse 10 and 11. He says, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, these words, these couple sentences that Paul wrote, were so radical and so explosive in the first century. And I don't want us to just hear them as Bible verses. I want you to just grab a hold of how beautiful and radical and explosive they were. You see, in the ancient Roman world, humility and greatness were not equated with each other at all, like Paul just did here. Um, humility was actually looked down upon. It was looked as uh, being ill-informed or being silly. It was looked as being suspect uh, because the greatest value in the ancient world was not humility, it was not the love of others, the service of others. It was actually the love of honor. Or in the Greek language, it was philotimo. Philotimo. And this was the idea of being uh, obsessed with your honor and what people thought about you. And you puffing out your chest into every room you walk into. You trying to blow people's mind with your intellect all the time. That's what the ancient world was all about. But Paul says Jesus changed all of that because he was ultimate greatness because of his ultimate humility, ultimately him giving up himself, serving the entire world. I mean, this was a radical idea. And I'll argue that our entire world is now formed by not just the teaching of Jesus, but by this radical action of Jesus going to the cross and ultimately humility for you and for me. Our whole world is shaped by it. I mean, it, it's something that's modern psychology says now is something that is beautiful to us, something that we're attracted to. I mean, psychology shows us that we are more attracted to people that are great and are humble than people that are great and know that they're great and want to tell us why they're great in outline form. Uh, one of the greatest stories I've heard about this is Sir Edmund Hillary. And if you don't know who Sir Edmund Hillary is, he was incredible. He's actually the first guy to ever uh, conquer Mount Everest uh, many, many years ago. And he was just on top of the world in multiple ways when he conquered Mount Everest, but people were really taken back by his humility. Uh, years later, he was in his 60s and he was at a local pub and there were some uh, mountain climbers that were there and they noticed that, isn't that Sir Edmund Hillary, the guy who conquered Everest over in the corner? So they go over to him, they're trying to get like selfies with him, they're trying to get some pictures with him. And one of the guys uh, that was also at the pub looks at them and starts laughing at Edmund Hillary saying, 
oh, look, you, you guys handed him this ice pick. He doesn't even know how to hold an ice pick. And so he starts berating Edmund Hillary saying, old man, don't you even know how to hold an ice pick? And he moved it around to where uh, Edmund Hillary was supposed to be holding the ice pick. And what did Hillary do? He didn't berate the guy. He didn't say, don't you know who I am? No, he said, oh, thanks, chap. <laughs> thanks, man. I'll hold it like that. And he sort of just giggled to himself. What great humility this man who had conquered Mount Everest showed. He was a man of greatness, but he was humble. And people were drawn to him in amazing ways. Now, my friends, you don't have to be a Christian or a follower of Jesus to appreciate and be attracted to humility. But I just think you have to admit that the reason that you think humility is a great thing and you find it beautiful is because you're living in a world that was shaped by Philippians 2 and the actions of of Jesus, the ultimate humble servant. I mean, one of the things that Edmund Hillary did when he conquered Mount Everest, what did he place up there at the peak of Mount Everest? He took a small cross and he placed it right there on top of the peak of the mountain. What a strange and beautiful thing that he did, putting the symbol of the lowest kind of death imaginable in the first century on top of the world. My friends, this radical humility of Jesus shaped the world and put the worst things on top. I'll also argue that humility that Jesus showed, it actually shaped science. I mean, for so long, people have uh, pegged science and religion, science and the Bible, science and faith against themselves. But there's a lot of good reasons why we can believe that this humility revolution led to the scientific revolution. I mean, it was, it was all started by Jesus and Jesus' followers. I mean, think about it this way. The scientific method says this. It begins with a humble confession. I don't know how this works. I don't know why this happens. It's a humble confession saying that I don't know everything. And then you get into the scientific method and the, the system of it. I mean, you have a theory and then you test your theory because you don't know if it will work. And then you repeat the test because you don't want to just take one uh, strike at it. You want to repeat the test because you want to make sure because you're, you're not thinking that you've got all the answers. Then you invite others to scrutinize the results of your test. I mean, the whole thing is a humble confession. It's kind of amazing. There's this guy named Peter Harrison, who for many years was the professor of science and religion at Oxford College. And he, he wrote extensively about the origins of science and the scientific revolution with the Christian faith. And I love this quote from him. This is sort of the thesis of his findings. He said, the limits of human reason and the fallenness of our brains led to the scientific revolution. Jesus' humility and him saying that I'm going to give myself up and it leads to a humble heart in his followers that led to the scientific revolution. I believe also that humility, it's so powerful, it shaped influence, it shaped leadership forever. I mean, it's kind of amazing, the great philosopher Aristotle, he said this in his book on rhetoric about how to influence people, how to change people's minds. This is what he said. He says, we believe good-hearted people to a greater extent and more quickly than we do others on all subjects in general and completely so in cases where there is not exact knowledge but room for doubt. Character is almost, so to speak, the controlling factor in persuasion. Now, what Aristotle is getting at here, he says, if we come across people that we like, that we trust, that are humble and don't think too much of themselves— in areas where there's room for doubt and they're not sure and we're not sure, we will believe them more than other people. Isn't this true that we just like and we believe and we trust people that we think are humble, that we admire more so than people that we don't like? I remember years ago, I was a youth pastor and we were holding these events at the church and we would fly in speakers from out of town, speakers from really big churches, speakers that spoke at huge uh, youth camps in the summer. And I got to work with multiple of them. And there was one guy I got to work with who just, he just blew my mind because before and after he would pick up trash, he was trying to connect with students. He took an interest in me and wanted to buy me coffee. And he would send me texts and just pray for me throughout the year. And I remember listening to his sermons a couple years later, and I would just think everything he said was brilliant. And I didn't even know if I actually believed what he was saying, but I wanted to believe everything he was saying because I was so taken aback by his character. And character, I mean, it's, it's amazing. This is what Aristotle says. It's almost the controlling factor in persuasion. We are drawn to humility and we believe 
in humility. And not only that, just to take it a little bit into the science realm, when we talk about joy and humility, I believe that these two things are wired into our bodies and they are connected. You know, recent neuroscience shows us that when we help others, when we serve others, when we don't think about ourselves all the time, but put our time, our talents and our treasures towards helping others, our brains have an incredible thing happen. They release oxytocin, serotonin and dopamine. They make us feel good. These hormones, they actually suppress the stressing hormones in our body and they help us and they make us feel good in this scientific, biological, neuroscience way. Some people actually call this the helper's high. It's what our bodies actually do is we feel high when we help and we serve others in humility. And some of you guys, this is a better high that you guys should try out is serving others naturally. You guys, this is what Jesus did, is he went ultimately in humility for you and it led him to ultimate joy. And if that's true, shouldn't we think that a life marked by that kind of humility should lead us to joy as well? I mean, you guys, happiness is chasing after things for me. It's just chasing after things for me. But joy, you guys, it grows in us. And when we model Jesus, his way of thinking about life, his phreneo, and we model that idea of humility in our life, and we empty ourselves of our privilege, and we think about others more than we think about ourselves, that is where joy takes off in our lives. That is where joy takes off in our lives. So I wanna challenge you in a few ways here. I want you to realize that every day when you wake up, you have two choices to make. Am I going to live a life? Are you going to live a life where it says I need to be served? Or are you going to live a life that says I am here to serve others? (laughs) Thinking about others, emptying ourselves of our privilege and our power for the sake of other people. Will I live to be served or will I live to serve? My my friends, what what would this look like for you if you decided that you are here on planet Earth earth to serve your coworkers during this crazy season of COVID-19, to lighten their load, to be efficient, to be punctual and on time, to go the extra mile, to be a great teammate at your job? What would that look like to serve your coworkers? What would it look like in this time of us all being home so much to serve your housemates, to serve not only your kids or your parents or your spouse, I mean, don't wait for them to ask you to do something, but have eyes to see the things all around your home that you can do to lighten their load, to serve them. Not just thinking about your needs, but thinking about the needs of your kids, your spouse, uh, your parents, whoever you are living with. What would it look like, you guys, to serve your neighbors in humility during this time? We see our neighbors more now than we ever do because we're spending more time at home. What would it look like to serve them? Not to like sarcastically mow their yard because you think their grass is too high, but what would it look like to bake something for them or to just make dinner for them and leave it on their doorstep? What would it look like to bring their trash can up from the street to their house just to lighten their load a little bit? Be creative, but what would it look like to be people that are not here to be served, but to serve? I believe that our lives would start to be marked by joy and we take our eyes off of ourselves and our stresses and our anxieties and our fears long enough to be rooted in to the joy that God wants to give us that is in a life of humility. So here, I have four challenges for you this week. Four challenges. First, I want to challenge you to reflect daily on what Jesus did for you. Whether that be through checking out something on Right Now Media, whether that be through doing a a weekly Bible reading plan, whether that be listening to worship music and focusing on that or having a devotional, I want to challenge you to reflect daily on what Jesus did for you. Reflect daily that this incredible God from heaven on his heavenly throne, his rightful place, he lowered himself and he emptied himself of his divine privilege for you. I mean, just be blown away by that. Reflect on that. Spend time thinking about that this next week, every day. The next challenge I have for you is to pray to see opportunities to serve every day. Pray that God would give you eyes to see opportunities for you to be humble and to be in service and to forego your privileges for somebody else this week. I mean, begin your day saying, God, help me find ways to serve people. You will be blown away, you guys, when you pray that 
honestly, how God will almost open up categories in your mind and give you opportunities and let you see things that you wouldn't see otherwise. But ask God to help you see opportunities to serve people every day and then act on it. Here's another challenge I wanna give you. Celebrate what God is doing in other people. Celebrate the good that God is doing in other people's lives. I mean, so often, if we can be honest with ourselves, when we hear about good things happening in other people's lives, we, sometimes our first reaction is to get jealous or to think that maybe that means there's not gonna be good in my life now. But celebrate the good that God is doing in other people's lives. Don't just do the misery loves company thing, but celebrate it. Just say, God, thank you for the good that you are doing. You'll be blown away by how you'll start to be marked by this mindset, this freneo of humility when you celebrate the good that happens in other people's lives. And here's the last challenge. Give God credit for the good things that he brings to your life. There's another place in the New Testament where Paul says that every good and perfect gift is from our heavenly father. I'm telling you guys, your life will start to be marked by joy because of the humility that will build in you if you stop believing that everything good that's happened to you is because you've worked so hard and you start acknowledging that they're gifts from God. <laughs> he brings so much good your way. If you just stop and think, God, this is not just because of me, this is because you are a good father, it will start to mark your life with humility and you will start to experience joy in incredible ways. Don't pull that American card that you've, everything that you have, you've worked so hard for because God has given you something better than that. He says that you are his child and he's a good father who's given so much to you. So give God credit and let humility take root in your life. You guys, I wanna leave you with this thought right here. For our lives to have meaning at the end of our lives, we need to make sure that our lives are a means to an end that's bigger than ourselves. Let me say that again. For our lives to have meaning at the end of our lives, we need to make sure that our lives are a means to an end that's bigger than ourselves. In other words, we don't want our lives to be a means to an end and the end is our happiness. For our lives to have true, deep meaning and satisfaction and joy right now, we need to make sure that our lives are a means to an end and that's bigger than ourselves, that's serving other people, that's giving ourselves away. That's where ultimate meaning is found. And at the end of your life, if you want people to line up at your funeral and you want them to say something about you, you don't want them to say that he was really good, she was really good at getting what they wanted, at being happy. No, you want them to say they served, they loved, they gave themselves away. And it was so inspiring because their life was a means to an end that was bigger than themselves. So my friends, will this week, will you live to be served or will you live to serve? Will you cling to your privilege, your rights, or will you set it aside? Will you empty yourself of it to humbly serve others? My friends, that's where the joy is found. It's in a life marked by humility and service. So let's live to serve this next week. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for who you are and how you have given us this invitation to live a life marked by humility, not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less often and serving others and emptying ourselves for the sake of others. God, it's a paradox. It's hard for us to understand, but we see in your son, Jesus, the ultimate joy he experienced because he gave it all away. So God, I pray for my friends today that they would just know what their next step is, that you would just give it to them clearly and that they would have the courage to follow up on it. God, that they would reflect daily on what you've done that they would pray for you to give them eyes to see opportunities to serve, that they would celebrate the good that you're doing in other people's lives and that they would give you credit for the good that's found in their lives. God, we thank you that you give us this defiant joy for such a time as this. Help us cultivate it and fight for it this next week. Everybody agreed and said, amen.